Thanks, Boris, uh, for the introduction. So as Boris said, I'm a physicist by training, but I've been uh, interested in development for quite some time now. And uh, what I wanted to share with you today is some of the questions that can draw physicists to the subject and also what we're, you know, brings us together with the biologists as part of this um, program. And, you know, as a disclaimer, I've used the words uh, make an animal uh, in my title as um, shorthand for uh, the development of multicellular organisms, but I should say that our program is really equally concerned uh, with uh, plants and animals. And, um, all right, so um, I'll be giving this uh, at the board uh, as the tradition uh, demands. But first, I'll just wanted to show you a couple of movies because I, I think it's just too difficult to do justice to the subject without showing a, a movie or two. So Boris says it's a cheating, but yeah, nevertheless. So these are uh, a couple of movies showing the early development of a frog and a plant embryo. Right, and I think that even for those of us who've seen uh, these kinds of movies uh, many times, it's hard not to be struck by the, the feeling of this very orderly process that seems uh, kind of irrepressible in a way. And there's a sense of an inner logic uh, driving these processes that is what we would like to, to grasp. And so in a nutshell, what I'll tell you today is that there's a lot that we know about how these processes work but still putting all that we know together into a coherent picture of how development proceeds is not so, so easy. Right, so I'll do it with a screen. What I'll need to do first is give you a, something of a quick introduction to development. So, you know, this will be intended to, for non-specialists. So I see that we have some eminent biologists in the room and I apologize if uh, uh, this is boring to them and I, I hope that I don't, don't embarrass myself so much. So, um, as you've seen in, uh, from these movies, there's a, a lot going on uh, during development. And a common way to break down that uh, complexity is to distinguish what is called patterning and what is called morphogenesis. Can't see anything though. From the middle. Okay, good. Okay, so patterning uh, in the context of um, development refers to the process by which uh, different cells acquire different identities with a certain arrangement in space. So an example of this would be starting from an embryo where all the cells are initially equivalent. Then this becomes broken down into three domains where cells have assumed uh, three different cell types, which I'll show here with different colors. All right, so that's what we would call patterning. And on the other hand, we have morphogenesis, which is the process by which uh, cells change shape and rearrange in space to give the organism its form. So okay, returning to this cartoon. You could think of these three different, of the cells in these three different domains as they're forming in different ways to form different uh, structures. Like this. So looking a little closer at uh, uh, these different processes, starting with uh, uh, the emergence of different cell types, as you may know, there's dozens of different uh, cell types in your body, like uh, blood cells, muscle cells, neurons, and so on. But these many different cell types don't emerge in one step. The way this occurs is that starting uh, from a single cell, the egg, there's a gradual emergence of progressively more specialized cell types which can be organized in what is called a, a lineage tree. And now all these cells share the same genome. So the way you can get different cell types is um, uh, when, um, when the same cells express differentially 
the same genes to produce different amounts of the same proteins. So an important aspect of patterning will be gene regulation. And uh, the way this works is that some particular proteins uh, can regulate the expression of other genes. So the way we would represent this is by drawing a narrow between gene A and gene B to indicate that the protein that is expressed from gene A modulates the expression of the protein uh, from gene B. And so if A activates B, we'll draw a pointed arrow. But we will, if um, B inhibits, C would represent this with a blunted arrow. And typically, these interactions form densely interconnected networks. So these are what we call um, gene regulatory networks. So these, as I've represented, shown here, these networks can be uh, very intricate. But to give you just a, one, a simple example of what can come out, if you just have two genes that mutually inhibit one another, then a cell could either exist in a cell where there's a large amount of protein A or in a state where there's a large amount of protein B. So that could be a simple model uh, for a binary decision between two possible states. Now, if we return to uh, morphogenesis, on the other hand, that's a largely a matter of mechanics. So a lot of the tissues that we're looking at are formed of a single sheet of cells, so we can represent them in two dimensions, like so. And at the interfaces between these cells, there are molecular motors that allow the interfaces to contract. And if, as I've depicted here, there are more of these motors along the junctions that are along a certain direction, here the vertical direction, then the tissue would tend to contract in that direction and extend in the other direction. So that's one way you can form an elongated structure as I've depicted here. So um, the question then is how are these two processes uh, coordinated? And one sort of has been a sort of a default hypothesis in the field is that patterning lies upstream of morphogenesis. And this sort of makes sense. You know, the, the notion is that you first need to make different kinds of cells before they move in a, differentially. But we'll see that's not necessarily the, the case. Now, uh, coming back to uh, patterning, the question is then how do you uh, establish a spatial structure in a developing embryo. And here there are two broad conceptual models for this that have been proposed. One is what is called uh, positional information, which was introduced in the late 60s by Lewis Wolpert. And so the idea here is that there pre-exists in the tissue a gradient of some molecular substance. And then the cells will be able to uh, determine the position by reading the level of that substance, which we call a morphogen. And so then cells that are at different positions will know uh, that they should adopt different fates. And so there will be, um, as a function of this level, different thresholds corresponding to the boundaries between the different cell types. Now, what you should note here is that in this idealized model, the cells are responding independently to some extrinsic cue. An alternative to this is that the um, pattern emerges through the interactions between cells. And so this is what is called uh, self-organization. And the first explicit model for how this could happen was uh, first introduced by uh, Alan Turing in the form of what he called uh, reaction diffusion models. So the way uh, this works is that you imagine um, molecular substances that can diffuse between neighboring cells and interact among themselves. And so one very simple uh, example of this that has been pretty popular is what is called the activator inhibitor model, where you now have one substance that activates its own production as well 
as the production of another substance called an inhibitor, which in turn represses the production of A. Right, so in the simplest setting, you would consider a one-dimensional file of cells, and if you take the continuum limit, you can write partial differential equations for the levels of A and B. So what these equations would look like are equations for the time derivative of the levels of A and B, where you'd have a production term which for A depends on both the levels of A and B, with some uh, degradation constant and a diffusion term. And the same for B. except that the production of B only depends here on the level of A. And what you can show here is that if you choose the parameters right, uh, you can have a situation where an initially uniform uh, state of the system will be unstable and small fluctuations will be amplified to form a pattern. And one of the conditions for this to happen is that the diffusion range of the, act of the inhibitor should be larger than the diffusion range of the activator. So the kinds of pattern that you will get from this is one where you have peaks of the activator and the inhibitor diffuses more broadly to the sides, preventing the formation of other peaks to the sides. So if you uh, look at this, in a small enough domain, you would have just one peak of activator, but in a larger domain, you could get multiple peaks forming a periodic pattern. Now again, many of the tissues that we're looking at are two-dimensional. In that case, these kinds of models could produce patterns of spots or stripes. But in, and since this... Um, model has been introduced in the 50s, there have been many efforts to identify activator inhibitor pairs that could underlie patterning. And one example of this is in the patterning of the skin. So um, either in your, your own skin, which forms hair, or in the feather patterning in birds, there are groups of cells that express particular genes that form what forms the called primordia that precede the, the hair or feather, that are, and these groups of cells are being displaced. And there have been models proposed where the spacing, the spacing pattern is organized by an activator and an inhibitor. Right, so I should say that these uh, uh, two models for um, pattern formation, positional information, I should write it here, and self organization are really two extremes in a continuum. And in most, yes? Yes. I'm sorry, I forget what you call it. The, the positional information. Exactly. The yes. Positional information. Thank you. So you said that the cell senses the level of these chemicals. How does it do that? Right. So yeah, I should have said like uh, one of the ways that um, uh, you can get these differences in cell types is that cells will respond to molecular signals. Um, so what you'll have is that certain cells uh, produce particular molecules that will bind to receptors in other cells, and in this receiving cell, activate a cascade of molecular events that can impinge on the um, expression of the genes in the receiving cell. So, you know, these molecules, these, uh, these morphogens, as they're called, could be signaling molecules, and one simple scenario for this is that you have a source of the morphogen at one end, the morphogen diffuses and is degraded, giving you an exponential gradient. Right, so I was saying that the, these are really too extreme and that um, are likely combined as, uh, in most processes in development. And um, you know, w one reason for this is that uh, self-organization never operates on a, you know, rarely operates on a, on a blank slate. And it's more often the case that there is some initial bias that directs 
um, self-organization towards um, a particular outcome. So we should, rather than spontaneous symmetry breaking, we can think of guided self-organization. And one example of this is in the patterning of the, um, the digits. So the, the simple fact that you can get uh, fewer or more than five digits um, would really argue against uh, the notion that there's a blueprint specifying the individuals, uh, the location of five individual digits. So there have been Turing models that have been proposed to explain the, the formation of the digits. But then the question is, how can you get this very stereotyped arrangement of five digits uh, most of the time? And then if you, if you were to uh, simulate a Turing light model in the fully developed um, hand plate, what you would get is an irregular arrangement of stipes, which would vary in number and in orientation every time. And so the, the explanation that was suggested in a recent study of digit patterning in the mouse for the formation of this stereotype pattern is that you have a lot to allow that patterning and growth are happening at the same time. And if, if you simulate this model in a growing domain, what you would get is that at early stages, you can just form a small number of uh, spots. And then as the hand plate grows, you would be inserting uh, more digits in a deterministic sequence, reaching always the same um, outcome. And you know what this tells you is that the the number uh, of the digits should crucially depend on the timing of growth and differentiation. And a confirmation of this is that if you look at mutants where the hand plate overgrows, they can form more digits. And interestingly, we had a a talk during our program suggesting that much the same happens in the patterning of leaf shapes. So if you look at the leaves that have so-called uh, serrated shape, so with this kind of tooth-like uh, shape on, on their margin, it's known that there's a self-realized molecular process um, that directs the formation of these outgrowths. And here again, what controls the layout and number of these outgrowths is the timing of growth and differentiation. And the confirmation of this is that if you look at mutants where the differentiation is blocked, they will keep growing and adding more and more outgrowth to produce an extremely convoluted shape. Right. So another reason that these simple um, Turing models are too simple is that it's often the case that there's more than two signaling molecules involved in any process. So returning to the example of the skin, there are recent studies that suggest that there's not just one or two signaling molecule involved, but three signaling pathways with a dense network of interactions among them. So if you have many more players, it's harder to uh, understand what the outcome will be. And also, it's not, the cells can not only communicate to molecular signals, but also by mechanical forces. And here, so again, uh, in the skin, it's been proposed that mechanical forces could play an important role in patterning. So what is known is that these um, patches of cells with specific gene expression are associated with patterned aggregation of the cells. And what a recent study of pa um, feather patterning in the chick indicated that is that this pattern aggregation may, may well proceed and lie upstream of um, gene patterning. So here it would be really these morphogenetic events with mechanical forces leading the clustering of the cells that are the origin of the pattern. So returning to my diagram here, you can really have the arrows going both ways. Right, so this sort of sums up my quick introduction to development. And in, in short, what he, we have are these two models for pattern formation, positional information and Turing models, none of which are obviously the, the full story. And we don't know really what, uh, what a more general model would be. And also patterning and morphogenesis are intertwined in many systems. So what I'd like to do now is go into a little more detail in an example of how uh, mechanical and molecular patterning uh, can be integrated, and then move on to discuss whether there's a, uh, 
general framework within which we could consider the two um, together. So for this, I'm going to use um, an example from um, work that I've been a part of because that's, uh, I can speak better about it. But as I've mentioned here, there are other examples of the role of mechanics and patterning in, in the literature. So this is work um, in collaboration with a group of Jérôme Gros at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, where we have been looking at the role of mechanics in the early development of the avian embryos. That would be the embryo of birds. Historically, a lot of this used to be uh, on chick embryos, but Jérôme's lab is working with quail. And so the, um, what the early embryo looks like is like a, a flat disk. And within that disk, there's a smaller circular region that will give rise to the tissue of the embryo proper. So participate in the body of the adult, which are surrounded by extravenic tissue. So the, these are support tissues that will not participate in the, in the body of the adult. Now, um, this is a very um, convenient system uh, to study because it shares many aspects of its development with other vertebrates like ourselves, but it's much easier to work with. You can just essentially crack an egg in a dish and follow its development for uh, hours, if not days. And so, more specifically, what we have been interested in is uh, an early stage of development, which is called gastrulation. So this is a, a stage where the internal tissues of the body are set apart. So these would be here in this linear tree, one of the very first uh, bifurcations. And the way this um, occurs is that there is a, so this would be the posterior side, and at the top, the anterior. There is on the posterior side a convergence of the cells towards what is going to become the anterior posterior axis of the body. And so if you track the movement of the cells, there is an initially crescent shaped region that will converge in one direction and elongate in the other to give rise to this structure called the primitive streak, uh, which prefigures the anterior posterior axis. And this is the site where the cells that will contribute to the inner tissues will internalize. And so it has been uh, described for close to 100 years now is that uh, the formation of the primitive streak is accompanied uh, by tissue-wide rotational movements. So you have these um, movements inside the embryonic disc. That are strongly reminiscent of vortices in a fluid. So the question we have been asking is whether we could really describe uh, these movements as those of a fluid and what the driving forces are. And for this, you know, we took this idea of describing the tissue as a fluid literally and tried to describe these movements using the equation of uh, fluid mechanics. So we use the equation of Stokes for the motion of a viscous fluid, which relates the uh, spatial derivatives of the velocity field to the driving forces. Now, if these cells uh, were crawling on a substrate, then you would really uh, have a driving term which is, um, appears as an external force density. But since, um, as in this drawing that I made earlier, the cells are really pulling onto one another, this instead is replaced by the spatial derivative of an, um, a stress tensor representing these internal forces. So for, for those who are inclined in uh, see these, detail, these details, what you would write is the divergence of an active stress tensor. Now, um, what we did then is, since this equation relates motion to the driving forces, start from a precise quantification of the movement to infer what the forces might be. And what this uh, exercise suggested is that motion is driven by a tensile ring at this boundary between the internal and, exter and outer uh, domains. So you can think of this a bit as a tug of war. The cells all along this ring are pulling on one another, 
if they were all pulling with the same strength, then they would all be stalled. But if there, it happens that there's a gradient with the cells on the posterior side pulling more strongly, which drives a net movement towards the posterior. And what we could show is that a fluid mechanical model where motion is driven by a, a ring could quantitatively recapitulate the movements that we observed in the embryo. And then having done this, uh, we went back to experiments and confirmed in different ways the existence of this ring, in particular, by looking at the localization of these uh, molecular motors in the tissue. Right, so this was, you know, giving us a mechanical description of the early morphogenesis of the embryo, but then the question we ask is, how is this process controlled? And one simple explanation for this would have been um, that there's a genetic pre-pattern that directs uh, cells to pull with different strengths at different positions. And this, yes? Yeah, as I said, you, if the, the, the writing a, an external force density would be appropriate if the cells were crawling on a substrate, because then it would be the, the force that they exert on the um, direction of the substrate. But here, we, you could sh think of this more as a freely floating sheet. So it's really the internal forces in the tissue that are driving motion. And then the appropriate way to uh, represent these internal forces is with a, a, uh, sorry, a stress tensor representing the, um, how much cells are pulling on each other in different directions. And what replaces this external force density is the tensor divergence of the active stress. So that, uh, that's how the yeah, math works. Right, so you know, one hypothesis would have been that um, what drives this movement is a, is a pre-pattern of gene expression. And that's all the more likely that we know that there are certain genes that just have this kind of expression pattern in a ring with a gradient from anterior to, to posterior. However, we, we know from some classic embryology experiments that um, the formation of the embryonic axis can't be so rigidly determined. And the reason for this is that if you cut the embryonic disc in half early enough, you can get two fully formed embryos. So this means that this process has to be largely self-organized and that uh, both morphogenesis and gene expression can be dramatically redirected following a perturbation. So in the, in the literature, these um, observations had been interpreted mostly in molecular terms. So the notion was that there is some molecular inhibitor that is produced in the posterior uh, that diffuses and prevents the formation of an axis in the anterior. And this inhibition would be relieved when you cut the disc into two. However, the, um, no uh, molecular candidate for this role uh, was ever identified. So what we proposed instead is that um, mechanical tension that pro propagates along the margin could play the role of this inhibitor. Right, so um, what we um, considered more precisely is a model where the contractility of the cells self-activates and the tension that results and propagates uh, along the ring uh, acts as a long-range inhibitor. And so the um, writing an equation for this what we had is um, a partial differential equation for the time evolution of a contractility. Where it depends on the contractility and the tension. With a diffusion term representing that the self-activation of the contractility is slightly non-local. And in the simplest setting, which is to uh, treat this ring as one dimensional, you get that the mechanical tension along the ring is uniform and equal to the average of the contractility. So if you look at this and compare to the Turing model, you can see that this is very similar 
to an activator inhibitor. Yes? Well, the, um, what you would get is that the, the parts of the ring that persist in either half can continue contracting. Oh, you, you the uh, I'll, maybe I'll, well, I'll present next, but I'll answer that, that question. Right, so, yeah, this is very similar to um, activator inhibitor model in the limit where the range of inhibition is infinite, so because you, you have the detention, uh, which is the inhibitor, uh, is uniform. Now, so this is a model that we showed could recapitulate um, the formation of the embryo as a self organized process. But at the point you could tell me, since the equations of this model are mathematically equivalent uh, to the equations of an activator and inhibitor model, how do you know that this is mechanical and not molecular, right? And so the, um, actually what the model suggested is one experiment that would allow us to discriminate between the possibilities. And this came from thinking of what happens in the posterior half where you normally have an embryo that forms when you, when you cut it. What the model predicted is that in case the contracting domain should rescale with, with the size of what's left of the ring. So with about half of the ring left, you should get a contractile domain that is half as big. But critically, what the model implied is, is that this should depend on the mechanical boundary condition. So it's only the case that if the boundary is fixed, then tension can build up again, and you have this narrowing of the contracting region to restore the normal proportions. But if instead you assume that this boundary is free, so then the the tissue will be able to move in where the, the ring is pulling. Then there is no tension building up on what's left of the ring. And then the whole margin can contract. And so it happened that we could prepare these um, posterior halves in different ways so that they either attach or not. And what we found indeed is that when they attach, we had a rescaling of the contracting domain as predicted. Whereas when they were, the boundary was free, the whole margin contracted. But maybe, yes? So in the glass exterior model, there's no that they're screwing, but instead of they're in the same Yeah, so I should have said that um, compared to the, uh, this regime that I showed where you have a rather smooth bump, here we're in a regime uh, based on the observations of the velocity profiles. Uh, where the width of the interface is relatively narrow. So what you have is um, the solution looks a little more, more like this with a thin interface. And then when you, what you can, the, 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 the proportion of this domain, you should analyze in terms of the motion of these interfaces. And when you look at this, what you get is that these um, interfaces move up to a point where the where the t tension is equal to some constant, to some homeostatic tension. And so what you get then is that since the tension is equal to the average of the contractility, it's proportional to the size of the domain that contracts. So that's how you get that when you tend to a homeostatic tension, you must tend to a fixed proportion of the contractile region. So that's, yeah, how you get this scale. Right, so that was just showing that uh, indeed uh, morphogenesis could self-organize as predicted. But maybe most importantly, when we looked at gene expression in these embryonic halves that have been prepared in different ways, we found that the redirection of expression of genes that are normally expressed in the emerging axis was redirected in the same way as uh, motion. So in embryonic halves that had reattached, we had a relatively narrow domain of expression of these genes. Whereas in embryos with a free boundary, the domain of expression of these genes was much broader. So again, that was an example suggesting that self-organized mechanics could lie upstream of gene expression and, and development. Now, I should say that because, uh, yes? 
you know, on those scales, it, it's rather negligible during the process. However, um, to qualify this, I should say that it has been suggested um, that gravity may be one of the biases that uh, positions the posterior pole of the embryo. But I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that it's known for sure. Right, so as I was saying, the, uh, we know that there's a bias in gene expression that precedes uh, tissue movement. So this is not an instance of a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Rather, there's this initial bias that gets the movement going, that mechanical feedback canalizes development towards a certain outcome. And so we could think of this, um, of the embryo, as tending towards a self-consistent state of forces. You know, there's this uh, feedback between contractility and tension, and as cells pull on one another, they settle into this self-consistent state, producing a stationary pattern of motion that shapes the embryo. Now, there are many questions that this raises. For example, how does the um, mechanical feedback that we postulate on the Tisku scale arise from feedbacks on the cellular scale? And so I should say that that's, you know, it's a bit like uh, trying to ex uh, recover the equations of hydrodynamics from the physics of fluids. And it's a whole uh, area of research. And there's a really interesting convergence between um, um, the study of um, biological tissues and the physics of active matter. So the, it's still much in the making, but there, there's this idea that um, feedbacks on the cellular scale can give rise to exotic states of matter on this tissue scale, and that these exotic states of matter could function as substrates for mechanical self-organization. And what, what we know for sure from the study of active matter is that it can exhibit spontaneous patterns of motion in the absence of a pattern control. So possibly something like that is happening in the embryo, where the tissue has the ability to exhibit spontaneous patterns of motion, and any molecular layers of regulation are just steering the self-organized system rather than controlling every aspect of it. Right, so as I said, that's a whole uh, area of research, and I uh, don't want to discuss it more uh, now. What I wanted to do instead is ask um, whether this idea of a self-consistent state towards the embryo is tending uh, could be usefully applied uh, to molecular self-organization. So in a way, you could say that the answer is trivially yes. On the, you know, on the one hand, generally, because you could think of the steady state of any dynamical system as being self-consistent, but also specifically uh, for the example that I've given to you, because I've shown to you that mathematically, uh, the equations of this mechanically self-organized system and a Turing system are very similar. But again, I think it's a statement that is worth uh, uh, qualifying. And so for this, I want to return to this uh, uh, very simple uh, Turing model with just two interacting, yes? But I, I'm thinking just that, um, I guess I'm not using it in a very technical sense, but it's, it's just that the, this idea that um, when you have uh, equations that relate uh, uh, to quantities, uh, here contractility and tension, you know, a, a steady state will satisfy uh, uh, the equation both ways. Am I making sense? I'm actually never, never studied mean field theory, so I couldn't tell you. What, what, I guess it's in, in the same thing. Yeah. All right. So um, if we think it return to this, um, these simple Turing uh, models, one of the things that are clearly missing here is a clear distinction between the internal states of the cells and the signaling molecules through which they interact. So what you would really want uh, to consider instead that, is that each of these cells really has inside this complex gene regulatory network that allows the cells to assume different fates as the uh, tissue is being patterned. But then what you get is uh, a very complicated network of uh, gene regulatory and signaling interactions. And it's very, you could put these in equations, but it's hard to get uh, anywhere with these very, very detailed models. <laughs> 
And so as an alternative to this, um, what some of us have been trying to do instead is to write models for the internal dynamics of the cells that try to capture uh, the effective dynamics of paid dimensions in a low dimensional description. So this is actually a, an idea that was uh, uh, put forward by the embryologist um, uh, Conrad Waddington in the 40s in what he called uh, the epigenetic landscape. So the idea here was to picture the trajectory of a cell that is differentiating as a trajectory of a ball that is rolling down in a landscape. Uh, so I'm sorry for people who, who know the picture from Waddington's book. This is a rather lame rendition, but I asked myself if I could do better with a piece of chalk, and I figured that <laughs> I'd leave it there. Right, so uh, what we have been trying to do is uh, take this metaphor and uh, formulate explicit mathematical models of cellular decisions in low dimensions. So, um, yeah, I should say this is uh, something that, uh, you know, for which uh, Eric Sidge uh, should get credit because he really... Um, initiated this uh, way of thinking. And um, so typically what you would do then is uh, take a decision between a small number of phase, in the simplest case, you know, a binary decision, then write either um, a vector field that has two attractors in two dimensions, um, or even simpler uh, in one dimension, a potential um, right, two valleys. So I won't try to work you through an explicit example because I think it could be pretty fastidious to work you through the particulars of the biocontrol systems that we've been applying this to and draw all the vector fields um, by hand. But you'll have to trust me when I tell you that we can use these approaches to get some um, insights into the dynamics of uh, fate decisions that will be hard pressed to guess from the study of much more detailed models. Uh, but what I want to do, do now, right, is um, go from this um, description of the dynamics of a single cell to the collective dynamics of interacting cells. So what you should maybe picture now, instead of a, uh, a single ball roaring the land in the landscape, is an array of these balls, which I could connect with different lines to represent the interactions between cells that are within signaling range. And so in this uh, landscape metaphor, you can start thinking of these interactions between the cells as sorts of mechanical forces that are pushing the cells on top of the landscape. And maybe in that sense, you can also think of the collective steady state to which these cells uh, will tend as a balance, a state of balance of forces, somewhat similar to the, what we saw in the embryo. All right, so I should say that these ideas are probably not new. When Kurt Stern, when he introduced the notion of a pre-pattern, probably had something rather similar in mind. So uh, for Kurt Stern, the, this notion of a pre-pattern was a spatial structure in a tissue that would not directly mat manifest itself but would, would control where certain uh, differentiation events could happen. So in particular, one of the systems that he applied his to is the, the differentiation of the sensory bristles. So those are sensory hair on the body of the fly. And so the idea that this pre-pattern would specify in initially uniform tissue uh, the positions where bristles uh, might emerge. Now, interestingly, uh, Stern really didn't picture uh, these pre-patterns as something completely predetermined and static, but rather insisted that they were very dynamic. So for him, um, these pre-patterns were stabilized by interactions between the different parts of the pattern. And he was very explicit about the fact that these interactions could both be mediated uh, by chemical um, signals or by mechanical forces. All right, so anyway, this, you know, this way of thinking of a, a pattern as held together by the interactions between these pieces is not new, but I don't think we have a, yet a, a good uh, framework for, for this.
And you know, maybe um, yeah, this way of thinking about it could be a, a way towards this. But then the question here is um, whether we can say anything general about these kinds of patterns which depend on the interaction between the, the parts. And one of the appeals of thinking of fate decisions in uh, geometric terms is that you can enumerate a small, a small number of possible scenarios for the decisions between a small number of fates. And, um, roughly speaking, there's, there's only so many ways that you can put different valleys in, in a landscape. For example, if you have uh, just three valleys, there's essentially two ways you can do it. Either you can have one of the valleys wedged between the other two, or each of the valleys touching one another. And so one of the open questions that uh, I'm interested in thinking about is whether we can, in the same way, think of the collective dynamics of interacting cells and try to classify uh, different di structures of the dynamics that would produce a given pattern. Now the thing here is that if you um, remember that in every system you will have uh, different signals involved, possibly mechanics, is it's not clear that you are going to be able to do better than a collection of examples. So maybe if we want to generalize, we need a further layer of attraction. And what I would propose is that maybe this additional layer of attraction could be thinking of patterning in terms of information. So one way you could think about these uh, interacting cells is at the end of the day, what they're doing is acquiring information about what their neighbors are doing. And you could maybe then think of um, the final state of the pattern as a consensus among its parts. All right, and it should be said that there's, um, actually we have a theory of information in the form of uh, Shannon's uh, theory of communication, and this has in fact been applied to development, especially in the context of positional information. People have tried to quantify, you know, how, what is the information contained in a molecular gradient, how accurately is that translated in the downstream patterns of gene expression. But if we think of self-organized systems, maybe we need to allow that information is not just propagated and read out, but can also be produced and maybe self-organized during development. So I don't know exactly what form or theory would, uh, would this uh, would take, but I think it would probably be very unique uh, to living systems. You know, if you think of physical systems, what we're used to thinking of is that there are certain rules by which the parts of a system interact, and then you can try to work out is the system stable, unstable, and susceptible to pattern formation. And if it forms a pattern, uh, often this will be a repetitive pattern. Now in development, there are indeed some repetitive patterns like your image of the hair in your skin or digit, but there are also instances where every part of a pattern is different. If you think of the overall layout of a body into a head, a trunk, arms, and legs, all these are different. Can this pattern self-organize? And what's the theory for that? I don't think we know. And here also what you must allow is that, whereas you know interactions in the physical system can be contingent, at the risk of being teleological, teleological uh, we can allow that uh, during evolution, uh, nature can select just the right interactions to select a certain outcome of development. And that's you know, actually pretty reminiscent of uh, um, other contexts in biology. If you think of protein folding, for example, a protein is a chain of amino acids with certain pairwise interactions. If you pick these interactions randomly, then the protein would form a ball up when you place it in water in a random configuration that would be different every time. But actually, if you look at natural proteins, these interactions are chosen just in such a way that the protein, as it falls, will be funneled along a certain path and reach a precise configuration. And you could also make an analogy with uh, the um, storage and re um, recall of memories in Hopfield uh, models for neural networks. The idea here is that if you pick just the right interaction coefficients uh, between the neurons on the network, then if you provide just part of a pattern to the network as an input, it will be able to recall the full pattern. And you could ask, you know, is this in any way a metaphor for how patterns can form and regenerate in some contexts in development? And if you ask uh, Madhav Mani, who gave us a talk about uh, inferring the interactions between cells in a tissue, I guess you could say, yeah, maybe there's some thing to it. 
So that's, you know, very open theoretical questions. I'm not sure what the answer to these are be, but I think they're in the background uh, when we're thinking at the, about the logic of particular biological systems. And I should also say that we now have a, um, more and more tools to address these uh, questions experimentally. And I must mention here, in particular, uh, synthetic systems. So these are systems where people uh, put uh, stem cells in culture to try to recapitulate um, development. And so this, these synthetic systems are re-emerging as a very powerful uh, tool to study development. And I should say they're also the, the topic of the Kubio course that is run in parallel with our program. And it's pretty amazing what these stem cells can do. If you, for example, if you place some uh, mouse embryonic stem cells in culture, they'll initially form an irregular clump, but after some time, uh, they will organize spontaneously into a head-to-tail axis, and then this axis will break down into somites, which are the periodic structures that prefigure the arrangement of the vertebrae in, in the body. So it's pretty amazing what they do, but nevertheless, what's also remarkable is that when you look at these gastrulates, as they're called, they're not quite the same thing as a mouse embryo. So this is telling us that you know, self-organization in development is not geared towards an invariant outcome. And said, you know, the idea is emerging is that maybe we should think of uh, cells as possessing a certain potential for self-organization that in the normal context of a developing embryo would go along a certain trajectory. But if you remove them from that environment, could take a different path, but at the same time being organized. So yeah, there's this idea that the outcome of development is um, not an environment, 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 sorry, invariable, uh, um, typical form. So yeah, if you're used to working on animals, you can have this idea that any deviation from the norm is an aberration. But for those of us who are working on uh, plants, you're very used to thinking that uh, variation in form is much the norm and phenotypic plasticity is uh, adaptive. So I think, yeah, there's still a lot that we can look forward to studying with the system. Thank you. Well, yeah, I think the interaction between a developing organism and the environment is a pretty deep um, philosophical question, you could say. And there, um, some of the um, tradition has been to oppose uh, nature and nurture, and the idea that there's some inherent program in an embryo uh, that runs along a certain course and can maybe be influenced by the outside from the environment. But there are also you know, some people like, I'm thinking of Susanna Oyama, who has a, a book devoted to that question, um, uh, who has critiqued this idea and suggested and said that we should think of um, um, development as the co-product of the interactions between the organism and the environment. And you know, incidentally, the, the, the title of her book is The Ontogeny of Information. So you know, she really, I think, has an, a very interesting discussion of the idea that there's not information or blueprint or program or code stored somewhere describing how the embryo should be made, but all this is a process um, that depends on the interaction between its parts and weather environment. Yes? Um, you mentioned that you kind of have to say, what in your opinion are the most interesting open questions in this field of research? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tall order. Well, yeah, I've mentioned a few. I think the, you know, the um, collective mechanics of cells, you know, on, on a very physical level, the collective mechanics of uh, cells into tissues is uh, emerging as a very important field of study. And as I mentioned, uh, closely connected with uh, active matter physics. 
um, something that I did not mention at all is that um, you know these uh, landscapes that I drew. Um, for a time, the best that we could do is make an educated guess as to what the structure of this landscape should be, uh, based on what we knew the possible fates to be. But now, with the advent of single cell techniques, it's possible to measure uh, the expression of every gene in hundreds or thousands of cells. And when you analyze the data, you can actually reconstruct uh, a low dimensional manifold along which uh, the cells are living in these sorts of bifurcation trees from the data. So there's a sense that maybe you know some of these things could be directly drawn from the data, but at the same time, uh, we'll still need a theory for what are the possible structures of these dynamics. So I think that you know, the interplay between data-driven approaches and this kind of theoretical th thinking is something to look forward to. One of the limitations we can say of extracting these cell landscape from the data is you could say, now what, you've described the landscape of the cells, what happens when you put two cells together, 100 cells in an embryo, what, what does that data help you say about this? But then again, you can think of, uh, and again, that's what Madhav Mani uh, discussed during his talk, also think of uh, doing, collecting high dimensional data from all the cells in an embryo to now starting what's the collective structure of these states and you know, what he was trying to suggest is you might infer the couplings between the cells similar to the Hopian model of neural network. So there's just two of you. I'm sure there's many more that I'm forgetting at the moment. Yes? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I glossed over it, but you know, typically when you write these kinds of landscape models, you will have a stochastic term to allow for variability and development. And actually, some of the particular systems that we applied this to, we didn't have real-time data to track the fluctuations of what the cells did in, in the end. But we, what we did see is that whereas there's an invariant outcome in wild type, when you look at certain mutants, you have what is called partial penetrance but some animals will give one phenotype and other animals a different pattern. So then, you know, you could fit uh, the noise level to these proportions of different outcomes in order to say essential to have this variability built in the, um, the model. And I think that also the jury is still out on whether um, the progression of these style states is mostly rolling deterministic down on the landscape, or if we think, should think of these as local minima and what governs the dynamics is the rate at which you can hop from one of these basins to the next uh, because of self-exertion. I think we still don't know. Uh, that's a, another open question for you. <laughs>